Hello, and welcome to this Royal Launch Build Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Jack Phillips, digital editor of Motorsport, and I'm joined today by Simon Aaron, features editor, and one of the UK's greatest ever designers, I think, in John Barnard. So welcome, John. Um, you are here at the Royal Launch Build Club because today is quite a big day with uh, the launch of your book. Yes. So, um, the perfect car. Yes, uh, something that I feel I never achieved, but um, was always striving for, and that's why the book is called Perfect Car. Um, yes, it's interesting. It happens to be uh, my wedding anniversary as well today, so <laughs> I shouldn't have forgotten the day, but um, of course I did. <laughs> Are you going to do one called The Perfect Husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do much on that, I'm afraid, no. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure she's got a, a nice dinner to come to. Oh, tonight. well, yeah, so, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's all specially laid on for her. Um, you've, you've, you've called the book The Perfect, the perfect Car. Um, I mean, you've been out of Formula One for quite a while now, yeah. 18 years or so, yeah. um, designing furniture and stuff. I mean, but, mm. you know, I mean, would you do a subsequent volume maybe, I mean, about your, your other life? Or does, is, is it that still the motor racing still a dominant, the dominant? Well, I think motor thing? racing has got to be the... Th the thing that people would be would be drawn in by um, it you know it's interesting isn't it I mean when I got into motor racing I got I got into motor racing because that was my passion I mean well cars were my passion when I started you know I was nine ten years old and fiddling about with my dad's Morris 8 or Morris 10 whatever it was um, I should say helping him fiddle about with it but you know from that time on Cars have been my my one in basic passion, and um, and then having been to college, started full time employment. Um, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, <laughs> I really want to be doing something that I'm interested in for the rest of my life, and that's when I started writing around. So, the idea that um, you know. Motor racing is something that never leaves you, I suppose. is um, it, It's true. It's, it's always there. But when you work your way up and then you get, I mean, you get basically get to the top of Formula One, as I did. Um, therein afterwards, it's where do you go? You know, it's very difficult to take the slide down. I tried it. I tried it with, I moved to the Arrows team. Um, and then moved to the Prost team, not not in the same capacity. I was a consultant at Prost, um, but it was just wasn't the same. I mean, yeah, the the reputation you take with you is actually a hindrance rather than a help because people expect things. You know, it's like at Arrows. I mean, uh, I went there and I was able to make some changes to their existing car, um, which actually made quite a difference. And we got very near to winning, I think, probably the only race that Arrows would have ever won at the Hungarian Grand Prix. Um, but, um, and that kind of, <laughs> that kind of reinforces what people expected of me. Um, and, uh, how can I say it? That wasn't really what I joined Arrows for. I joined Arrows because I thought, you know, I just need to, I need to kind of back it off a bit, so somehow, because I never, you never do, you know, it's just can't do it. But then, ironically, the table that you designed kind of started this book because it brought you into touch with the author, uh, the ghostwriter. Of the book. Indeed, yeah. I mean, that's uh, Nick, who wrote the book, the bio my biography. Um, he'd been right, or oh, he was writing a book on design in Britain, uh, and he contacted me through my colleague Terence Woodgate who I've been working on the furniture with and, um, and then Nick phoned me up started talking to me for the book he was writing and after a while he said oh you know didn't know any of this this is quite interesting um, anybody ever mentioned to you about doing a book and I said well many years ago somebody mentioned it but when you're in the business it's not a good idea in my opinion so um, so no you know and he said well you know Fancy doing a book? <laughs> so I thought, yeah, okay, why not? Um, you, you say you don't think you ever designed the perfect car, but you, um, I think you're the only person who has a car in New York's Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. Um, 
you, you crafted the McLaren that won three straight world titles, 84 to 86. You came up with the paddle shift Ferrari. Yeah. And the Museum of Modern Art as much. Mm. What, what separates those cars from the perfect car? What, what was the missing ingredient that would have <laughs> made the perfect car? Can you pinpoint it? Um, well, actually, if you take the Ferrari, um, that Ferrari, the 640 and then the 641, which is in the museum, which was just the, 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 had very small development from the 640 to the 641, that, um, that, was, that was pretty good, um, but it started as, um, what I was trying to do with that shape, was to enclose the back of the car. I, want, I knew that radiator exits were difficult and a problem to deal with in terms of airflow over the rear wing and so on. And so I was trying to get the airflow out of the, the back of the car without disturbing the wing. And then I, I wanted to keep refining that shape so that it would um, just get smaller and smaller at the back. Um, and, and, and give me as clean as I could. So I suppose that was the first step on where I wanted to go. And in fact, what they're doing today is more or less where I wanted to get to, which is a, a back end of the car, which is completely packaged and really tightly packaged. Um, and that, that was, if you like, the first step in, in going that way. So from that point of view, it wasn't perfect. Um, it was a first step. And it wasn't a bad car at all. I mean, you know, it's pretty good. Um, the other thing I think with the perfect car is, is I look back at the Chaparral, which was, um, which was, I mean, that was another car I did from a completely clean sheet of paper, as was the Ferrari, the 640. It was a completely clean sheet of paper. And, you know, you don't get the chance to start with a completely clean sheet that many times. Um, so, uh, the chaparral was fantastic because I basically drew everything on it. Um, I had a, one assistant um, uh, design draftsman guy who was drawing uh, the bits that I'd schemed up. Um, and then another guy, very briefly, who was a superb draftsman and, and drafted the actual body sections for me so they could be made. And that was it, that we drew the whole thing. We drew every nut and bolt on the car, apart from the engine. Um, so, and then when it was made, everything went together. There was nothing that didn't fit first time off. We took it to America. The first time it tested was at Ontario Speedway in California, which is a replica of the Indy 500 track. And it just, it just came out of the box, put, was bolted together in Midland, Texas, trucked out to Ontario, and it just worked. It just worked straight out of the box. Um, I think that was about six weeks or so before the Indy 500 in 1979, and then it went off to uh, the Indy 500 for the first weekend of qualifying. It had one spring change. I think they, they, I wasn't there because I was getting the second car ready back in UK. Um, I made one front spring change. It qualified on the front row. Um, it should have been on pole, but it qualified on the front row. And it, it led the whole race, well, led half the race well out in front. Um, and then had a gearbox problem or gearbox cooling problem because the oil pump on the gearbox wasn't man enough for the job but um yeah so that you know that was almost a perfect situation draw everything everything gets goes together car goes on the track works first time uh you know almost wins the big one of the big three because you know the big three are monaco indy 500 and le mans and um and that would have been just about perfect if it had one. I mean, of course, the Chaparral 2K, it did win the Indy 500 in 1980. Mm. Um, and I'm fairly certain it's probably the only Indy 500 winning car that's ever been sketched out in a, in a residential property in, 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 um, in North London. 
Oh, <clears throat> yes, you mean... Designed um, on your dad's living room, didn't Designed you? in my father's front room, absolutely, yeah. I wheeled the drawing board in there. Um, my father was actually writing the parts list for me as well. Um, did, did he help you with that in the same way that you helped him with his Morris 10? No. Uh, by that time, uh, I, was, I was long gone on to uh, <laughs> race car design. <laughs> he, uh, he, was a, he was an engineer, but he wasn't that kind of engineer. Um, uh, but, you know, once again, uh, as you will see in the book, um, my parents were fundamental to my success, or whatever you want to call it, um, in racing. I mean, that, that support um, was always there right from day one. And as I say, even, I don't know, when I was doing the chaparral, my father must have been, gosh, 75, something like that, 76. Um, and uh, was you know he was still there to help, basically. You make sort of clear in the book that your mum was also a oh yeah very talented engineer oh, yeah. as well and yeah. had a mind. Yeah, well she was she was more practically talented, um, and she I suppose was the driving force uh, in my mind that we, you could basically do anything if you set your mind to it if you. You know, just understood the basics and set your mind to it. Then, really, hey, you can do it. You know, you can do pretty much what you want. Uh, and she was very. She had a, quite an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, my father was more the the rock, if you like, the sort of the base, the base. You know, the base of the family. And she was the. She could be a bit, um, you know, off, fairly wild at times in what she wanted to do. But uh, yeah. Uh, she was very, very, very important to me. Just, just as we're chatting, actually, look, look what's just, look what's just ah, turned up. Well, there you go. Yeah. So fresh. First. There, there you go. Have you, have, you, have you seen it previously? I've never even, never <laughs> seen it, never touched it until now, which is, which is interesting. Don't read it now. I mean, no. You probably, you, probably, you probably know what's in it anyway. <laughs> well, I hope so. But, but I mean, you, you must, you must. Um, I touched upon the chaparral, and you, you, uh, you had two stints apiece with. McLaren and Ferrari, yeah. we'll chat about in due course. Yeah. You must feel an incredible sense of pride that, uh, you know, all this time after you were last involved in Formula One, all modern Formula One cars have two things that, you, I mean, we, we can credit Michelin with radial tyres. Yeah. Colin Chapman gets the blame for aerodynamics, although I'd argue that Gustavi fell in about 1914, did something with Persia. <laughs> um, but, you know, all yeah. Formula One cars have carbon chassis. That was the John Barnard invention. And they all have pedal shift gearboxes. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Was the jumper? Where'd you get these ideas? Uh. What, 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 <coughs> was the, what was the seed that kind of led you down? Yeah, I, I get routes? them. I get them because I was always searching for the perfect car, and um, the carbon monocoque came about because at that time we were running uh, ground effect underbodies, and the wider um, and and the wider and and better your underwing, um, the more downforce you were going to make. And at that time, with the aluminium monocoques, there were no, you know, there was, what shall I say? There were none around that were significantly narrow uh, in the bottom section. Um, you needed a certain amount of torsional stiffness in the monocoque, and uh, to make it narrow meant you would lose that torsional stiffness. Geometrically, uh, um, the geometry would cost you. So to return it, you needed a stiffer material. Um, and I considered the options, and through meeting uh, what happened now? I got I got an invitation to go and look at, at uh, British Aerospace at Weybridge uh, and see what they were doing. And they were making the big um, uh, RB211 engine um, outside cowlings in carbon there. So I had a look, and I just reckoned that you know that had to be the material for the monocoque. It was light. It was stiff. It was strong. Um, but it was it was 180 degrees different to design with. 
from a metal structure. Um, so it, it, you know, it was one of those things, that's the material I need, now I've got to figure out how to use it. Um, so you asked me how I came up with the idea. Well, I came up with it because I was pursuing better aerodynamic package. I wanted more better underwing, I wanted more downforce from the underwing. How do I do it? I make the monocoque smaller and the underwing bigger. Now, if I do that, I've got a problem with the monocoque. You know, that, that, that was the thinking. Um, with the paddle shift gearbox, it was pretty much the same thing. I mean, when I started, all I had in mind was to get rid of the gear shift run. The, the gear shift run, the mechanical gear shift run that everybody used at that time, uh, went through the chassis or outside the chassis and either went outside the fuel cell or through the fuel cell. <coughs> it went alongside. I mean, it was just a nightmare to a get clutter. clutter everywhere, horrible joints all over it. Um, and I just thought, I can, you know, this, this really annoys me. <laughs> I don't like this at all. How do I get rid of it? Well, I'll just have a button on the steering wheel. And, and because I know we've got these electrohydraulic valves available today that work in milliseconds. So all I need is to put a valve onto the gear shift at the back and a button on the steering wheel. And, uh, and I can get rid of the gear shift. So that's where it started. Then, of course, once you start going down that way of thinking, then you realize, well, actually, we need we can link the clutch together with it. Um, you know, the electronics can control that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hang on a minute, we only we only need a two-pedal car, so now I've got brake and an uh, accelerator. And so you build up on it, but the, the fundamental was, um, I'm really tired of trying to get that horrible mechanical linkage down the car. So it was just, you know, it's, it, it's how it works. And, and, you know, that's most of the stuff that I've done. I mean, everything, even little things like flexures, you know, taking the joints away from the suspension. Um, I mean, it's just about getting a better package. That's really what fires me up. And that kind of acknowledgement that the knock-on effects <coughs> and snowball effect of one change can have an effect further mm. down the line somewhere yeah. else in the car. Yeah. It takes you kind of back to Lola when you were developing these V yeah. and you'd have Eric Broadley come in and say, well, yeah. we need to do this. And yeah. then everything you've done has now got to be started again. Yeah. So I guess that you were just tapping into an old mindset you'd picked up from 20 years before. Well, I mean, Eric, you know, Eric, Eric was, uh, Eric is brilliant. Um, I mean, apart from, the, apart from the fact that Eric gave lots of us um, our first start in motor racing, which, you know, can never thank him enough for that. Um, uh, no, I mean, it, he came to me, I think I'd been there about nine months, um, you know, from cold, pretty much. Uh, hadn't worked in motor racing before that. And I think it was about nine months, and he came along and he said, hmm, he said, uh, how would you like to design a car then? <laughs> what do you mean, Eric? Well, I've got this new formula, Super V, he said, and uh, we need, uh, we, we want to do a car for it. So I thought, okay, fine, you know, let's have a go. Which was probably my mum's side coming out, you know, sure, why not, let's have a go. You know, never done it before, hey, so what? Um, and, uh, and I started drawing this thing up, and then after, I think it was about a week or two weeks, I'd been drawing up a chassis, which was a tube frame chassis, and drawing all the suspension bits and pieces, and then he came in one day and he said, hmm, we had an engine there, a Volkswagen engine that, that VW had sent us that they wanted to use in the formula, and we had it sitting on a box in the drawing office. And um, he came in one day and he said, hmm. he said, Volkswagen want to change the engine. They don't want that one, they want this other one. Oh. <laughs> so they wheeled that one out, wheeled in this other one, and of course it was a completely different pickup, completely different mounting. And I was looking at it, and I was there, I was just staring at this thing for hours, trying to figure out what I was going to have to change. And it must have been 8 o'clock in the evening, and Eric came out of his office, wandered in, he said, oh, what's up, lad? I said, Eric, I don't know, I don't know. I said, you're going to have to start all over again, I don't know what to do. Oh, he said, um, don't worry about it, he said, he said, go home, he said, uh, give it a couple of days, he said, you'll find the answer. <laughs> And that actually, that, those few words stayed with me right the way through 
my career. Actually, they stay with me today. I mean, if I come up against a problem, particularly you know, in the, in, the, in the engineering side, and I don't have an answer at the time, I just, okay, go home, you know, come back again tomorrow, attack it again. And at some point, you will reach a position where you, you either have to make a compromise or you'll find a perfect answer, one or the other. But, you know, it, it, it's usually a, uh, usually a compromise. And so, um, so that kind of, I just, I just remember that from Eric, um, you know, just don't, you know, don't stress it out. You're not going to get the answer in a, in a couple of hours. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's a very different world now, isn't it? I mean, when you, guys like yourself and Patrick Head were given opportunities by Lola, um, Britain had lots of volume racing car constructors, Lola, Chevron, yeah. Roger, Ralph, yeah. Mark, yeah. Um, Reynard, um, where young, young, young ambitious engineers could go and get an all round become <coughs> get an all round education in the the whole art of the racing car. Yeah. Whereas now people tend to become the world's best damper specialist or the best front wing end plate specialist or whatever. Yeah. But you don't get the same yeah. kind of global education no. that you did, do you? Do you regret the way things have gone? Um, well, I uh, I don't know whether I regret it because I'm not involved in it, but. It's part of the what's happened in racing, or certainly what's happened in Formula One, where things have just become so huge, teams are so huge, the money is so huge, um, and the technology, you know, once you open the box, you cannot uninvent the technology. And you can do what, you can change the rules, you can do what you like, but you've pretty much got that technology there. Uh, and and the technology requires a lot of people, you know, a lot of specialists. Um, I think the I think the problem is, and and uh, I was talking about this yesterday, um, is that by getting the all-round experience we had, people like myself, Patrick, and so on, um, when we evolved into Formula One teams, bigger teams, let's say, we automatically had a kind of pyramid structure, in a pyramid sort of management structure. And we were on top of the pyramid, and we made the, deci the fundamental decisions. And if we were correct, we were winning, and if we were not going down the right path, we weren't winning. Um, but today, the system doesn't produce that. And consequently, what you get is you get managers, you get technical managers sitting on top, trying to control uh, groups you know, of specialists. And you're going to get a situation, I believe, where somebody's going to make a compromise because, you know, for example, um, aerodynamics will want the minimum cooling, you know, exit or the, or the bodywork as tight as they can get it around the engine. The engine people will say, I haven't got enough cooling, we need more cooling, da 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 and so, and toing and froing, toing and froing. Somebody's got to sit there and say, okay, you've got to compromise here. Okay, aerodynamics, you've got to compromise here. Engine people, you've got to work on your cooling system, you've got to get it more efficient. So, you know, somebody has to, in my opinion, somebody has to be doing that. Um, I don't know, but uh, I don't know. I was told yesterday that apparently Mercedes started with this kind of typical big company matrix type of management structure, whatever that is, uh, and have changed to a more pyramid type of um, uh, setup. McLaren when Marty Whitmarsh came in, changed to the kind of matrix type of management system. Um, and, well, you know, now they're in trouble. Um, in my opinion, they should change that system back to a more pyramid structure because that's what Formula One requires. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, it, you know, which is right, I'm not sure. But um, uh, certainly, you know, 
It's it's certainly it's now it's a situation where it's so big, so much money is just you know you, you start turning an oil tanker. It's not going to happen. We have a similar question actually from a reader. We have more questions than I can remember for any mm. podcast. Ah. That much interest. <laughs> and so many questions to ask. Helgi eighty six asked on those similar lines that uh, you used to be able to come through F three and F two from the very bottom to the top. Is it good for racing now that there is no ladder? Mm. People are going in, I guess, at the top or midway to the top, mm. gaining that experience and that. It's all we'll make as well at that level now, so the, cre- the, yeah. the, the scope for, cre- yeah. for creativity is, is gone. Yes, I, yes indeed. Um, it is a shame because there, you, there, there, there was creativity happening at those lower levels as well, which, as you say, is now not happening. Um, I don't know whether that's a result of the rules or whether it's a result of somebody deciding that if it's a sport, then you should, you know, it's a driver sport. It's, you're comparing drivers, or you should be comparing drivers. Therefore, the only way to compare them is to put them in the same car. Yeah. You can still make small changes to the car, set up changes and so on, which, uh, which you know, if, you, if the driver's working well with a good engineer, he's, he's going to get a little bit more out of the same car than the other guy that isn't working well with, a, with an engineer. But it's, it certainly stifles uh, imagination on the technical side. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think it helps the driver situation because to be a good driver, to be a top driver in Formula One, used to, Less so now because of all the information that's pouring in all the time off the car. The driver used to be able to tell his engineer what was wrong with the car, what he or what he wanted from the car. And between the two of them, if they were working well and the engineer knew his business, then they would get that sorted out and they'd get the maximum out of the car for that driver. So I think by all working with the same kit, the kind of the drivers not getting that education, if you like, not getting that working with the car sort of education in, in the same way that he would when they were driving different designs, different cars, different, you know, different setups. Um, so I think it's a bit of a shame, really, that it's all gone down that road. Yeah. On, sorry, on the uh, topic of drivers, um, who was the best, do you think, at that? Would it have been Prost? Yeah, for me, Alan was the best um, at, at, at deciphering what he wanted on the car. Uh, he was fundamentally incredibly quick. You know, he was, he was not only a brilliant at sorting the car, he was, he was a brilliant one-lapper for qualifying. Um, but he, um, his, I think one of his big gifts was he could, he could distinguish the t- a tire problem from a car problem. And if you watch lots of his races, first 10 of 20 laps, he's just, you know, he's just cruising around. He's just easing it. Because when we started with a full tank of, what, 230 litres or something, you really had to be careful about your tires. Because if you just push too hard, you know, in the last 20 laps, you've got nothing. Um, and that was before sort of tire changes were normal in during the race. Um, so his ability to measure the tire, to feel the tire, was to me incredible. Um, yeah, I, I think I never actually worked with Senna, but I think Senna. Uh, I suspect Senna learned a bit from Prost, to be honest. Right. And current drivers, um, who do you think would be the best? As a reader, one has asked, mm. who would you think would be the best driver now? Hamilton is quick, don't, you know, I mean, why, how Hamilton ends up qualifying behind Bottas, I've no idea, because he's just got half a second in his pocket any time he wants it, over Bottas. So Hamilton is, to me, the quick guy. Um, I don't really know much about Vettel, but he seems to be working well with Ferrari and getting, you know, getting it out of the car, perhaps more than Raikkonen. I don't feel Raikkonen to be um, a real 
great car sorter. He's quick and he's brave, and he's you know he's one of the, he's more of an old school kind of driver. But um, I kind of feel that Vettel's probably getting a bit more out of the car. After that, wow, I really don't know. Hard hard for me to say because I don't know much about the others to be honest. Yeah. It's all about getting working well with Ferrari. Good way to <laughs> move into that. So obviously, a lot of readers have questions about Ferrari. Uh, common themes seem to be: Do you think it was the good, best idea to work in England rather than Maranello with, <laughs> with hindsight? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it happened because um, I was finding life difficult at McLaren. Um, for various reasons, and uh, I got the call. I got, uh, I kept refusing them on the basis that I wasn't going to work abroad. I, you know, I got a family. My, some of the kids were at school, um, and I, that, they still t take top spot as far as I'm concerned. You know, I don't put my career before my family. Um, so I said, sorry, I'm, you know, I'm not moving out. I'm not going to be based in Europe. Then they, they came back and said, would you like to set something up in UK? What they had in mind was just a sort of drawing office, you know, like this room with a few drawing boards and so on, and me beavering away there, and then visiting Maranello every, every 10 days or so. Um, and I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to set something up in UK, but... You can't design, for me, you cannot design just uh, in an isolated situation, especially with composites. You need to be able to try something. You need to be able to try making something. Um, you need to, uh, you know, have a certain capacity. And on top of that, Composites were quite new at that time, certainly for chassis. Um, we're talking end of 86, 87, first time at Ferrari. Composites were still quite new, and I, well, and you know, there was the big deal with, with Villeneuve uh, being killed, with the, the composite monocoque coming apart and so on. And so I said, but, you know, I've got to be able to make critical components in the UK under my control. So we ended up setting up a small factory with a fantastic autoclave clean room set up. Uh, and I managed to bring in um, guys that I'd worked on the original carbon monocoque with, namely Arthur Webb, one of them. Um, and he got some guys from um, uh, like Marconi, British Aerospace, guys that were using composites at a really high level. So we managed to set that up then with a design office there, which I then felt more comfortable in, in producing the monocoque there and suspension parts and so on. Because frankly, I just didn't trust having it done out of my reach uh, in Italy. Um, so, uh, you know, it became a, yeah, a small factory, if you like. Um, I think probably more than they'd anticipated but they went along with it, and they said, "Fine, you know, let's uh, let's do it." Um, the politics were quite severe. I think at one point you even had to produce your contract. Oh yeah, well that was all over the paddle shift gearbox. Um, unfortunately, uh, Enzo, who hired me uh, initially, uh, died in '88, which was where we were. We were right in the middle of a very strange year in Formula One. We had the, the year where the, they were trying to introduce the turbo, or sorry, remove the turbo engine in place of a normally aspirated engine. And so they went through this year of 1988 where turbos were supposed to be limited by a, a, a pop-off valve, um, limited to two and a half bar pressure, and which theoretically gave the normally aspirated engines a chance. It didn't. The turbos were vastly more powerful. And the only people that really had a serious turbo were um, McLaren Honda. Honda sort of produced this engine pretty much for that uh, uh, regulation. 
and we at Ferrari used the turbo that we'd used in 87, um, turbo engine and, and car pretty much that we used in 87 with just a few modifications. So it was a really funny year in terms of competition, but it, what it meant was that the car that I designed and built, which initially was would have raced in 88, became um, pretty much became a test vehicle. And that was the that was called the Type 639, and that was the first car with the paddle shift installed properly. Um, and uh, that then got I it evolved into the Type 640 that we raced in '89. But the problem was that um, Enzo died in the middle of '88, and there was a guy who came from Fiat who owned 90% of Ferrari. Uh, to effectively take Enzo's place. And he was um, just petrified that the paddle ship wasn't going to work. And he was demanding all sorts of things. He wanted, a, he wanted a mechanical shift version of the car. And I said, look, you know, you can't do it. I mean, the whole purpose of the paddle shift, number one, is to reduce all that stuff gear linkage stuff, and that allows me to make the monocoque narrower, smaller, better aerodynamically. Um, but he was so terrified that, that it wouldn't work on his watch, that he was demanding all sorts of things, and I had to pull my contract out and say, look, I've got to tell you, I'm technically in charge of all this, <laughs> and if you want to change it, you know, then there's the contract. But anyway, he, I said, if it doesn't work, if it's a disaster, fine. There's my contract. I'll walk away. You know, and you don't even have to pay me to walk away. I mean, we'll go. So that was, um, yeah, that was. <laughs> there, there was general surprise, I think, even within the team when. Yes. God, <laughs> uh, perhaps even That's a nice end. way of putting it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, when Nigel Mansell won in Brazil yeah. in '89, yeah. the paddle shifts first yeah. race. Yeah. I mean. I know there was talk beforehand of putting on a good show and yeah, that's half, right. half tanks and that's things right. like that. Um, how, how confident were you that the thing was going to last? Oh, I wasn't confident <laughs> at all. No, I wasn't confident at all, but I wasn't, I wasn't and, as and how, how so lacking. were you as the, as the race wore on that the thing was still going? Well, I wasn't so lacking in confidence <laughs> that I was only going to put half a tank of fuel in, which is what Cesare <laughs> Fiorio, the team manager, suggested. He said, why don't we put half a tank and make a good show, you know? Sort of lead the race, and then oh, you know, we've stopped, sort of thing. Oh, wow, well, you never know, Cesare. Let's just fill it up. <laughs> so we filled it up, and even then, um, through no fault of the paddle shift, really, somewhere through the race, I can't remember whether it's sort of halfway, probably about a third through the race. Nigel came on the radio, screaming, "My steering wheel's fallen off! My steering wheel's fallen!" Nigel, what do you mean? He said, "I'm, I'm driving." He said, "I'm driving by having to." push the wheel against the column to steer. Crikey, right. <laughs> Can you get in? Yeah, I'll get back in. Okay, so he came in, and we got the quick-release steering wheel. And, of course, because it was paddle shift with a, with a clutch lever, and, the, uh, and the, you've got, you've got a, a, an upshift lever and a downshift lever, and then a clutch operating lever as well, all on the wheel, um, all linked by a central plug in the steering column. And the electronics boys, I said, have you got a spare wheel, have you got a spare? Yeah, we've got a spare wheel, but you know, this is the Magnetti Morelli boys, but you know, we're not sure it's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, we're not sure about all the connections. <laughs> give us a wheel, give us a wheel. So um, chief mechanic, Joanne Villadel Pratt, um, was on one side, and um, I think I le leaned in and pulled the wheel off on the quick release, he had the new wheel and he smashed the new wheel on so hard he actually broke off a switch lever in his hand. He hit it, so, hit it on so hard. And, uh, and Nigel selected first gear and drove off and we were like, <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? It worked, you know. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was incredible, that race. 
Uh, because, I mean, but, but what happened was, yeah. sorry, what happened was that, in fact, it was nothing to do with the electronics or paddle shift. The steering wheel was held to the quick release boss by three bolts. Two of the bolts had fallen out. Well, that was a mechanic problem. Nothing to do with the paddle shift. That was a mechanic problem. But, you know, the Italian press would have reported it as a gearbox problem. No, it's a mechanic problem, actually. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's... It's funny, isn't it? Because it won that first race, and then yeah. and then till mid season, and yeah, then, then I know. Finished again. And then we had we did have the reliability issues that 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 we were worried about. Um, yeah, I mean it. It was a long time, I think, before they figured out they. I say they because it was mainly the engine people um, figured out that in fact uh, what was happening was that the engine had an alternator attached at the bottom and it was driven by a tooth belt, rubber tooth belt from the front of the crankshaft and the um, engine was designed as a four main bearing engine uh, which meant that it was a bit of a a bit of a floppy crankshaft the cr when it was a sort of 12,000 rpm or something the crank would would uh, would wouldn't you know would sort of what do we call it well, it would, it would bend effectively, which meant that the pulley on the end of the crank would, would t move a tiny bit and that would throw the belt off and then we'd lose the alternator and the first thing that stopped working was the gearbox. So again, it wasn't really the gearbox, it was the fact it lost power. Um, um, but that got, so I think that was sorted and then things got a lot better. Um, yeah, I mean, there were still issues with it. But that kind of is... If you like, that was, I suppose, in some ways, the problem of my career is, you know, I often pushed on with new things um, and raced them before they were ready. But I was always worried that, you know, if you get a new idea and it's a good idea, the only way you're going to get any value out of it is to do it and use it before the other guys. So I'd always be pushing it, you know, forward. Um, Probably sooner than it should, certainly sooner than it would have happened today. I mean, today, you know, they'd have to be testing God knows how many months and, and hours on the test bed and all the rest of it before anything would be allowed out. But in those days, it, you know, it came down to the old pyramid thing and I said, let's go, put it on, that's what we're going to run. I guess also that scepticism you've been used to dealing with because when the carbon car came out, mm. people were assuming it's just. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to be pretty solid in your own mind that what you're doing is is fundamentally right, but tucked away in the back of your mind is, if it's not right, if there is a problem, what's my next move? What? How do I get out of it? So, you know, uh, luckily, I say luckily, um, John Watson had a, incredibly impressive looking accident at Monza with the carbon monocoque in its first year and got out and walked away and that accident is I would say fundamental to the ongoing life and acceptance of the carbon monocoque yeah. uh, actually in carbon structures generally to be honest with you um, because uh, we had uh, I had calls from the CIA Civil Aircraft Authority who wanted to come and look at this monocoque that had been through this huge accident to see how the damage occurred and you know what what it did to the structure. So it, it had big implications. Um, and uh, fortunately, I mean, fortunately, it turned out okay. I saw a, a panel quote on the archive actually, um, which from Ron Dennis in 2007 said, I hope John really appreciates that he's responsible for much of today's driver safety. And I think. Eh, Tyler Alexander echoes that in your book. Right. Safety is kind of an unspoken priority of yours. Um, yes. I mean, I don't want to sound too... Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't... How do I say this? Are you, you, you going to say that, uh, that safety was kind of a byproduct of aerodynamic efficiency? I think safety was a byproduct <coughs> of just good engineering. Um, Speed is always number one, yeah. you know, speed, lap time. That's what you're after. That's the key. 
But I think good engineering, careful engineering, on everything on the car will result in safety. It will result in a good car from, from a safety aspect. So I think that's more the way I'd look at it myself. Um, I, I, I suspect, oh, I don't know whether I should say this or not, because uh, I think I'm correct. No driver's ever been killed in, in one of my cars. The only time I got close to it was in Joe Bonnier in the Lola, three-litre Lola, when he got killed at Le Mans. Um, and, but that was only partly mine. That was that was you know I worked on the car, drawn some of it, but not not the basic car. Um, and that was probably more of an aerodynamic problem that we just didn't understand um, at that time. Um, but no, they, you know everybody so far has has walked away, and there've been some pretty big accidents. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we seem to run out of time. I think you've got to then go and sign and launch. Oh really? Book. Ah. <laughs> um, Hopefully we've answered all of the questions that we've sent in. There were so many, uh, so much we haven't covered as well. Mm. But hopefully they've all been answered. But one quick question before we finish. Is there one car that you wish you had designed or that is closest to being a perfect car? I wish, I wish I'd designed. Yeah. Gosh, difficult question. Um, yes, probably... I think the Lotus 72, the wedge Lotus yeah. with the torsion bars and so on, and the Cosworth DFE, that was pretty good. Uh, now, I'll tell you what I actually would, would like to have designed, and that's the Lotus turbine car that ran at Indy. Yeah. They had one when I worked at Bell Spinelli in California. They had one there in their, in their warehouse, and that was a piece of work and a half. That was, that was, that was quite something. <laughs> one quick question which is in here somewhere I can't remember who it was but if you would design the fan car just a yes or a no would you have pulled it out or would you would you have voluntarily drawn the car or would you have kept it running and dominated on the one um, well if I designed the fan car the first thing is, I'm not sure I would have designed the fan car because I thought it, it was fundamentally illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think Gordon Murray is probably watching. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry, Gordon, but yeah, that is what happened. It was thrown out. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, to say that those fans were there for cooling, uh, for pulling air through the radiators was a bit of a stretch of the imagination. Oh, yes, I suppose it did, but... Um, it just happened to be sucking the car on the ground at the same time. Um, no, I mean, you know, hats off. It was a, it was a good, you know, it was, it was a, it was a brilliant, brilliant move. Um, but I think you have to, you, you have to be able to have a pretty good argument that it's within the rules um, as they stand. Maybe, maybe we should have allowed sucker cars full stop. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, it's like doing away with ground effects. I mean, that that was a mistake. That that was just that was just Ferrari. They didn't have it at the time, yeah. and they just wanted to screw us, poor old English mob. So um, yeah. Right, before I get told off, we should wrap this up. So thank yeah. you again for Thanks, sure. joining us. Excellent podcast. Uh, uh, I do recommend the book. Definitely pick up when that comes out. Um, Simon, you thank you, Jack. We'll be back Simon. Um, next time. I think okay. we've got. Possibly Steve Parrish lined up, I believe. So we'll see you then.